Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Katie Sakura, and I will be your host for today's GFPD webinar, Navigating Family Planning After a Rare Diagnosis. We will be answering questions at the end, but please go ahead. Feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar. Our presenter today is Dr. Misha Kawanda, who some of you may know from some of her past work with our families at the GFPD. She graduated from McGill University with a PhD in biology in 2016, where she was focusing on molecular biology and genetics before she went on to get a master's in genetic counseling from Sarah Lawrence College. She worked for Dr. Braverman on the natural history study for individuals with paroxysmal biogenesis disorders. For the last four years, she has been working on the Simon Searchlight Research Registry for genetic neurodevelopmental conditions. Misha, thank you again for being here with us today, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting me um, share on this topic and talk about family planning. It's so intimate. It is a community, as mentioned, like so close to my heart, and, and it's such a pleasure to have a part of it again. I'll just start off by saying that I don't have any conflicts of interest to share. I don't work for any fertility clinics. I am I don't have any financial stakes in any of aspect of fertility treatments. Um, but I am a certified genetic counselor. So speaking on this topic is um, one that I, I'm very happy to talk about today. So you've probably heard about the, the genetics of the proxosome and seen this particular list before. So it's the 13 PEX genes, proxosomal genes that are needed to function properly in order for your paroxysome and your cells to, to work well. You probably also are familiar with the which gene runs in your family. I've just duplicated this list to remind us and remind myself to mention that it really is a copy from the one copy from your dad um, and one copy from your mom that has to be um, not working properly in order for you to get the ZSD in order to have a, a proxosomal biogenesis disorder. Um, it's ranked from most common to least common. Um, but all that to say is you probably know the genetic variant or the genetic mutation that was found in your family. For the rest of the presentation and, and webinar, I'll be talking about genetic variants, but you've, you've definitely probably heard families amongst each other talking about mutations, but also clinicians, geneticists talking about it being a mutation. This is an interchangeable set of words. So genetic differences are variations that are found in every single person, but by definition, a mutation is not actually harmful per se. The actual definition of a mutation is that it can be harmful, it can be beneficial, or it can have no effect. So that's that's a really important thing to remember, that it really is the cultural references, these, um, these sort of stories that we've heard that has made mutation have this negative association or negative connotation. The genetics community has um, tried to navigate that because when you get a genetics result, it's, oh, there's a variation or previously mutation, but there has to be an interpretation of what that actually means for your genetics in order to determine if it's harmful or not. Um, so that's why it's just, we've moved towards uh, the word variant because it is it is at least right now a lot more neutral. So those words can be used interchangeably. The inheritance, so how, how this um, condition is inherited, as mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's usually passed down from a, a, a gene in the mom and the dad in order to have an individual with the condition. And so this is called autosomal recessive inheritance. It's recessive. It's not, um, it's not that this, this dad or this mom who are carriers are expected to have any, any medical conditions associated with ZSD. Um, that means in this image that green is the working PEX1, for example, and blue is the non-working PEX1. And when they have a child, um, the probability or possibility of having a child that inherits both um, working copies of the PEX1 is one out of four. And about half the time, mom or dad will pass a working or non-working copy, so they'll have a kid um, or two out of four um, children that are carriers of this condition. Also not expected to have any features of ZSD. 
Um, and finally, you probably are joining the webinar today because you may have had a child um, that has received both non-working copies of the PEX-1, for example, and they end up having ZSD. Um, so all that to say is when we're looking for carriers, there's a few different types of genetic tests and options that are, are needed depending on your family situation. So I've just done a little um, image of this sampling that when we're testing for a carrier, we need to test the person individually. And I'll talk about what happens when we're testing a pregnancy down the line. But if you're testing a carrier and the you're able to get genetic testing of the this person, then you might know the genetic variants that are already run in the family. So if we want to, if we already know that it's PEX1 and it's this genetic variant and that genetic variant, then those targeted testing, um, the targeting testing will happen on the mom and dad to find out who carries which variant. If the genes are not known, if the if the on the whole list, if it's not known which one it is, and and you are unable to test the person with ZSD for whatever reason, then what needs to happen is a full panel test of all thirteen genes, full sequencing for mom and dad to figure out which variants they carry. If the gene is known, so we know that, for example, dad has PEX six. Um, and, and is, is now wanting to have a family with a different partner, then what would happen is that partner would need to have sequencing of the entire PEX6 gene. So finding out if you're a carrier is a little bit different in each of these situations. But there is an importance in, and, and sort of um, benefits to knowing your carrier status. And the most obvious one is why we're here today, which is the personal family planning. And so um, identifying and knowing the possibility for, for your family um, is obviously a benefit, but it also can help inform your family members. So it opens doors for them to get tested and them to make uh, decisions on their family planning. And then finally, also, there's a possibility of research participation. So potentially research, uh, more doors will be open for research participation if you have been identified as a carrier. In this example, um, I'm just going to walk through uh, how we how we started how we target um, the carrier testing in different families. So we found the PEX6 gene in this in this individual, and then we've identified which variant mom has and which variant dad has. Mom then can go back, and if she's able to talk to her mom and dad and potentially get them testing or she's able to talk to her siblings, so first degree relatives, then you are able, then that's how the sequence of testing goes for that particular targeted variant that mom was identified with. And why we do a stepwise fashion is because when her brother um, is identified as not being a carrier, then there's no reason to, to follow down that familial, that family variant in, in his children um, or subsequent grandchildren. Um, but in this situation, for example, mom's sister was also identified as a carrier, and then therefore her children would also be open to getting uh, having access to testing. And so sometimes family members are not available for testing, and so that can be navigated as well. But usually it's done in, in as stepwise fashion as much as possible, so it's not um, like a, fish, a fishing expedition amongst the family. It's, it's sort of done in this um, planned way. Furthermore, if you know the genetic variant, not all genetic tests are equal. So there's a lot of direct to consumer testing that's happening right now, but it's not always asking if that genetic variant is found in your family. So here's an example of this PEX11B. These direct to consumer tests, the Ancestry.com, 23andMe, um, the type of testing that they do doesn't look for these particular variants. What you need to make sure is happening is that you're getting a targeted single variant test for the variant that's found in your family. And so usually what you would do is go to a genetics clinic or a medical clinic if possible, and, and they would help you out. But, but bringing that lab report or that information from your family would be needed to make sure to, to say, yes, positive, you do have the variant that's found in your family or no negative, you do not. So now we'll go into the different actual family planning options. 
But to start off by saying that all options are supported and all options are are just as valid as any other option for yourself. So there's no wrong way for you to set up this this family and this this life that you would like to have because so many choices are needed to be made and so many importance and considerations are individual um, that we want to make sure that you have all the knowledge and then you can make your choices as you see best fit. One way to break down the options is that the first five options that I'll talk about are decisions about a pregnancy. So decisions about um, this point in development, whereas obviously with adoption, it's a post-pregnancy decision. So you're getting a child or an infant um, after they've already had all the pregnancy um, and, and birth occur. And that might be a distinguishing factor for some people. Um, So the first option, the most obvious one, is that you might decide to have uh, your pregnancies and and family planning without any genetic testing or any interventions. The second option is if you decide to further try um, getting pregnant and having pregnancies, but then you would like some genetic testing throughout that pregnancy. So it's important to note at this point that genetic screening tests, that's very routine in in, um, the prenatal clinics. So this maternal blood hormone measurements, it's done around 12 weeks, 14 weeks. Um, NIPT, this non-invasive prenatal testing, and that's also a blood test on the the mother. And the prenatal ultrasounds do not diagnose um, cell ligar spectrum disorders at SD. There's no combination of features or anything that we're able to say at this point yes, the pregnancy has it or does not. So this is coming back to this image of representing where the sample has to come from in order to get this diagnosis. So here in this situation, you have to test the pregnancy. So you have to take a sample from the pregnancy and I'll talk about how that's done. Um, But also genetic testing that's available to you is um, different at this point in this method versus for example, if we do IVF and I'll also talk about that. So here, if we take a sample from the pregnancy and the genetic variants are not known, that is okay. You can do a biochemical test. So you can, the the lab will do a test to see are the proxosomes functioning or not functioning within a certain range um, in order to give you a diagnosis. If the genetic variants are known, then then you do that targeted testing um, for those specific variants. So the two, um, the two points that samples will be taken in pregnancy, one earlier and one later, um, has both pluses and minuses as well. Obviously, this is an earlier time point in pregnancy when you're doing the CVS or the chorionic villus sampling, um, later time point with the amniocentesis. With the chorionic villus sampling, the CVS, you're taking a sample of the placenta, Um, And then with the amniocentesis, so that's, so the placenta is getting some, the cells of what, of what the fetus has as well. So that's how, that's how that's collected. But with the amniocentesis, you're getting the fluid and you can't do that earlier. There's not as much fluid earlier on in the pregnancy. So this is a time point when there's a lot more fluid and within the fluid has fetal cells. So you're actually getting the the fetal cells that come off with the baby, um, like breathing the the amniotic fluid and and just flaking off in in the sac. So this then, in both of these situations, the cells have to be grown up. Um, They have to be cultured in a lab so that they get more of a sample. This is about a two week process. And then they can do the biochemical test or the genetic testing. And that's also up to usually um, max another two weeks or so. So you are looking at receiving the results four weeks after the time point that you get the genetic test, the sample taken. And so there are some complications that and and mis and miscarriage um, possibilities with both of these tests. Um, As with any procedure, there's a risk of infection. There's a risk of um, not obtaining a sample. That's very rare, but it it is a potential complication. Um, But then also this risk of miscarriage. It's really important that you ask your medical center or medical clinic how often they do these procedures. The the lower chance of having a miscarriage or complications are associated with the centers that are used to doing this all the time. 
Um, and so that would be a really um, helpful sort of um, decision point. If you're asking your medical provider, you're asking your clinic how often it's done, you can also ask their rate. Their per each hospital or medical center should be keeping track of that. So that's another factor of what is your rate personally at the hospital. Um, but what's what's sort of quoted in general in, in the, the literature is about one in 200 chance of a miscarriage with CVS and about one in 500 chance to one in 900 chance, so even lower, um, for amniocentesis. So that means in the CVS situation, 199 people did not have a miscarriage. And, and to flip it also for the amniocentesis, that means 499 people did not have a miscarriage. So just um, considerations for when you're, when you're testing during pregnancy. So now in vitro fertilization or IVF, this is done in a, in a little bit of a different office. You would normally be working with a reproductive endocrinologist. And that's because this part, the beginning part is assessing the hormone and fertility of the person who will be carrying the pregnancy. So checking the ovarian stimulation and getting the overproduction of eggs in order to retrieve them for fertilization um, is just a unique and different situation than a normal OBGYN would, would complete on their own. Um, then usually what happens is you mix the sperm and the egg together so that you do a fertilization outside of the body and this sperm and egg coming together, you have the embryo that slowly starts to grow. And what is different here is that genetic testing can happen at that time point, a few days in, usually four or five days in, a sample is taken from the embryo. So it's just a few cells. And, and in this particular situation, if you're getting testing at this time point, genetic variants are very important to know. We are unable at this point to do peroxisomal testing on a few cells. So genetic testing happens at this point. That being said, though, if there were to be a pregnancy and, and you continue down the line, you still have the option of genetic testing, the traditional genetic testing in the pregnancy later on. Um, so you do have the option of biochemical testing at, you know, with CVS or amniocentesis at a later time point. You just don't have it at this pre-implantation or while it's still an embryo in outside of the body. Another option is that you could consider having a donor egg or donor sperm. Um, and to start off by saying the donor themselves donating the sample um, sometimes has genetic testing. This is very um, variable and not super common. So usually if you don't know the donor, um, this particular testing for your PEX gene isn't completed, but it's just, it's not impossible for the clinic to be in contact with the donor but also the post-step fertilization is not different in a donor or egg situation. You still would go through the co-incubation um, and implantation for the pregnancy. The difference here is if you are using a sperm donation, there is a possibility of doing in, in, um, intrauterine insemination. So there is a possibility of not going through the IVF process, but being inseminated in the doctor's office with the with this sperm donation. When you're choosing a donor, you do have some, some, um, some possibilities to make choices. Often you're given characteristics, but the physical features, you might want them to look like the rest of your family or, or your partner. Also, you might, you might have some fertility history or family history or educational history that might be really helpful for you for making the decision of who to choose. Um, sometimes in some situations, you might know someone that's willing to donate the sperm or egg for your purposes, but most time um, that they are um, not identified or they're, or they're um, anonymous. And then some clinics, well, most clinics have some sort of screening process, um, but that doesn't include prior genetic testing. It usually is like identifying blood type and stuff like that. That's part of their routine screening. Um, there's additional cost considerations in this situation, but also with IVF. So buying sperm or buying eggs will be very different from country to country. Fertility clinic, even within a country, will be very different. 
but in general, sperm is just less expensive. We're talking on the scale of hundreds of dollars versus eggs being more like thousands of dollars, just eggs being more hard, more difficult to get. Um, but it also will depend on how many, how many sperm samples you need and how many egg, eggs you're going to purchase. Um, and then this is on top of the whole IVF process. It, so, and some insurance will cover it and sometimes not, but this is um, very particular to each situation, but usually there's some costs involved. Um, the other sort of long-term considerations when we're thinking about uh, donor egg or donor sperm is that if you do go with a donor, then it still leaves one parent having a genetic link to the child that may be helpful for you in knowing your family history or, or half of the family history for that child. Um, but also a consideration that's becoming more and more common is that a donor sperm or donor egg is not as likely to be remaining anonymous. With the type of direct to consumer testing, the DTC testing that is happening, they are contacting um, further like direct relatives and less um, direct like, like fourth degree or fifth degree relatives to together, together if you um, give that permission when you're doing 23andMe, for example, or obviously Ancestry.com. So the idea that a donor is going to be anonymous is not really a, a, a promise that a, that a um, that the fertility clinics can really promise anymore because down the line they may be identified. Um, so the next one is embryo donation and adoption. So this has come about in the, in the process of doing IVF that couples have done in vitro fertilization for whatever reason, and they have leftover embryos from, you know, they've completed their family, they've used three embryos, but they have two left over. Um, it, is, uh, it is happening now that couples want to donate those embryos so that other families can try to ha have their family as well. Um, this embryo donation process is really similar to the process of adoption, and it is called embryo adoption because you are adopting um, this person or this, this um, soon-to-be person. The legal ramifications of becoming the legal guardian of this person are, are similar and the same in many ways. So you will still be working with a fertility clinic, usually um, now these embryo adoption agencies or um, or donors that you know, so someone you might know might be offering you adoption um, adoption of their embryos, so it may be direct, um, but often it is anonymous. Um, the agencies will help match families and they will help coordination of the legal aspect of the medical and counseling and contact between families if there is a selection process on either side. Um, and similarly to adoption, there is a home study. So the readiness to raise an adoption, adopted child is, is assessed. Um, as mentioned, the matching is a little bit different in every situation, but in general, if both, if both um, sides agree, the um, donor and the recipient, then, then the matching, then they're matched, and then they move forward with the legal um, adoption of this embryo. And then after that embryo transfer, so it will be um, like sort of that end of the IVF when the frozen embryo is then transferred to, to the carrying person. What factors to consider when you are thinking of IVF or the frozen embryo transfer um, are, are these list of factors. So in general, age of the person donating the egg or age of the person carrying the pregnancy um, has an effect on the success. Um, obviously, older may be, may be more difficult, but it may not. But, but in general, um, it can be helpful if the egg is um, taken from a younger person. Um, the quality of the sperm or egg has some, some um, importance. So the fertility clinics have a ranking. They look at an egg or sperm and they give it ranking based on shape for the sperm shape and motility, things like that. Um, and that can be related with success of the pregnancy as well. Um, previous pregnancy history. So if you've had pregnancies before, chances are you're going to get pregnant again a little bit easier. Um, uterine factors are like the shape of your uterus. If there's any reason that a implantation might be more difficult to occur. Um, hormone treatment and how you respond to hormone treatment. 
lifestyle factors, and the fertility clinic themselves. So the for some the, again, fertility clinics, just like hospitals, they're keeping track of all of these things. So some clinics will have better rates than others. And that's something that you can also ask. Um, you can ask what their rate of success is um, to give you an idea. And, and that has some influence on the pregnancy. And finally, um, of course, adoption is an option. And so this, um, this is just an example of one of the many adorably cute um, sort of adoption announcements that are now popping up all over the internet. So similar to a pregnancy announcement, there are adoption announcements. Um, but yeah, so when you're choosing adoption, you usually go with, uh, well, there's many options, but usually go with one direction. So for example, if you're going to go with domestic adoption, you're making that choice. You don't usually apply for international and domestic. Um, it's very expensive. It's very time consuming. Usually you would make one or the other. So if you choose international, for example, you'll go with a, a, a specialist like a, a center or sorry, um, a clinic that specializes more with this type of international adoption. Um, there's also private adoption. You may know the, per, the child that needs to be adopted um, or foster care. Um, but then also you have an option of how this adoption is going to end up in terms of how much contact are they going to have with the biological parents. So open being a lot of contact, close being no contact, and semi being some range in between. Um, but again, that, that is a choice you get to make as you're going through the process. Um, for the professionals, uh, the adoption agency, obviously, as mentioned, will be important depending on which direction you choose. They have social workers helping you. You would also be working with the lawyers and the facilitators, very similar to the embryo adoption. Um, for, for the actual registration and preparation, these beginning steps, um, you fill out an application and then you talk about yourself and why, why your family has chosen to go this route. Um, and you provide references for, um, from family members and friends about you and your partner as a couple, and then background checks. Um, often there's uh, preparation and training to make sure that you're prepared um, for all the possibilities of the child that you end up adopting. Um, and this sometimes is like uh, reading books, um, listening to webinars um, and things like that. It's not necessarily to test you. It's just to make sure that you're well educated about going forward and reassess it every time that you make a decision to keep going forward. Um, similar to embryo adoption, you have the home study, social worker writes up a report about the home study, you are matched, and then the, you fill, fulfill the legal, legal requirements to becoming a parent. Um, so that, that ends this journey of family planning options. I hope that it was helpful. Um, and if you feel supported in making the decisions for whichever path you end up choosing for building your family. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. I just kind of want to emphasize, you know, knowing the variants, um, you know, making sure that, you know, having that information just really allows family members to better access testing, really assess what their risks are for different family members. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different reasons for knowing your variants. And I just appreciate mm -hmm. you sharing all of that today. Again, I, I'm going to go back to some, I see some coming in, but I'm going to had a few ahead of time um, about the donated embryos. Uh, mm -hmm. can, are, are people able to test a donated embryo? So once that embryo is, is available, is that something that can be tested at that point? Or is it mm -hmm. you know too late to have testing done? Yes. So this is a great question. To my knowledge, Based on the process of when a sample needs to be taken, usually the embryo is dividing a few days in, a, in the dish, a sample is taken, and then it's frozen. When it's unfrozen, that's the time when you want to implant. It's not sitting in the dish again and gets frozen again. As far as I understand, that would, that would um, really reduce the risk of that being a viable pregnancy. So... I imagine maybe samples were taken um, for those particular embryos when, when the family was doing IVF. Um, but if genetic testing was already completed, then potentially the sample's already gone. 
Um, so if that family was doing IVF and was doing genetic testing, then probably they use the sample. Um, so potentially your only option would be to do the testing once they're already in, in the pregnancy would be my logical way of, of that. But that's a great question. Thanks so much. And we did have a, a comment come through. Let me know that the chat may be disabled for a few people. Um, I'm not sure if Zoom defaulted to that. Um, I'm trying to work on that, but there is that Q&A feature at the bottom. We have several questions coming through there. So please go ahead and use it. it just says Q&A um, with two little windows, like someone's talking, you can click on that and you're able to send questions right through to us if your chat's not working for you. Um, I apologize about that um, little tech issue. So we do have another question about, um, I have a daughter who was diagnosed 25 years ago um, and the variant was not looked for. Do I have to get her tested or can my uh, spouse and I get tested to identify the variant? Mm -hmm. If if she's available for testing, so it sounds like um, like she she's still around and you're able to, and you um, feel comfortable asking, then I, I believe that she would be the ideal person to get testing is directly testing the individual with ZSD. If she is unavailable for testing, you cannot get consent or or any other concerns. Um, then you would then you could go to to yourself in order to do the full panel and sequencing of all thirteen. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for for answering that for that family. Um, we also have another question. Are family testing for specific variants affordable? Um, siblings, aunts, uncles, do you begin this process through a geneticist? Mm. So usually you would go to a genetics clinic in general. Um, I, I think, and speaking with you, Katie, you were you were mentioning some reputable genetics um, labs that had testing that you could order from home. I was not able to navigate that. So you might be on the know that I'm not, um, that I wasn't able to access. Usually from what I understand, you will want to go to a genetics professional and bring um, the, the report of what was found in your family member. Um, but if you are able to get your own testing, um, what you're looking for in a genetics clinic is that they are CLIA certified. Um, CLIA standing for, um, so I get the words, uh, oh, I don't have the acronym written out, um, but what CLIA means, which C-L-I-A in, in, in North America, um, this is a designation that it has it has um, received federal regulations of the testing and that when you get a result from a CLIA certified lab, that it's a clinical result. Otherwise, it's not it's not considered a clinical result and it's not a confirmed um, verified lab. Um, so usually you would go to your medical professional, potentially start with your doctor for a referral. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd love to add to that for the person who asked that, that, you know, we've had several families at the GFPD um, use other outside um, testing facilities, and they've been successful, they've had good experiences. So if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to connect you with those families to share their experiences. But then, um, as Misha just shared, you know, you want to look for those, um, those certain things, the criteria to make sure that you're going to a reputable testing facility, um, as well as making sure that if you don't know your variants, that they're testing um, for all variants available. Um, so I've seen mm -hmm. that before. So I just thought I'd add that in. Mm -hmm. um, we also have another question that I'm going to hop to, which is... Oh, sorry, Katie. I no, forgot to answer the, does it cost? Um, is it, is it expensive? Yeah, or does you. it cost? Forgot about that. Um, so in general, again, um, my training and expertise being more in North America, um, in general, it is usually covered by insurance. If you, if your doctor recommends and says, oh yes, it's found in the family, you would be a good candidate to test next, then it should be covered by insurance. I'm sure there are exceptions depending on where you live, but in general, um, it should be covered and costs should be relatively low. Um, the cost of genetic testing has gone down so much in the last few years. So in general, even your insurance company is not being charged astronomical prices. It shouldn't be at least. Um, but sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, I'm glad you did. Thank you for catching that and being able to fully answer them. I know there's a lot of information um, and I, I'm glad that you're here to be able to help them with these answers. Another uh, family has submitted a question. 
Uh, you mentioned biochemical testing if any of the variants are unknown. As of now, my husband is known, but mine is not. Is this available to anyone anywhere? The team we've been speaking with never mentioned this option to help us better determine if a pregnancy is affected. Hmm. Um, yes. So this is something that happens, uh, the type of testing that happens on the pregnancy. So you yourself would not be expected to have any peroxisome issues. So that's why biochemical testing would not be um, would not be found to be helpful for you if you're a carrier. Um, at least that's the, what's known today in, in terms of ZSD genetics. It might be, it might be different in the future, but as of right now, uh, if you're a carrier, we wouldn't do biochemical testing to find out the answer. Um, but for, for the pregnancy, absolutely. Biochemical testing is an option, um, as mentioned, when you take a sample. And again, to the person in the audience who asked that, thank you for asking that important question. Um, I believe that that is uh, misunderstood sometimes, that you don't have to know both variants to be able to have um, a testing and have results during mm -hmm. a pregnancy. And we, again, have many families who have been in that situation. And if you ever you know, find yourself wanting to connect and talk to a peer that's been in that situation and been through that process, the GFPD is happy to connect you with those families that have been there. Um, we have another, we have several questions, uh, Misha. So thank you for sticking around for Q and a, uh, <laughs> is there, is there any news about having X linked adrenal leukodystrophy newborn screen applied in Canada soon? I don't know that we would know this answer, but I thought I would ask, um, especially since you did, um, work in that area mm -hmm. of uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. The, um, the professor that I work for, Dr. Wendy Chung really spearheaded, um, this, um, some of the uh and and still works very heavily in in this um uh screening in in the US in terms of Canada um and Canadian myself um and so it would be near and dear to my heart but as far as far as I know um I, I don't think so but Canada does follow um, many, many of the guidelines that are very similar to the US. So this is something we could follow, I could follow up on and look into, I'll, I'll just write it down. Um, but I don't actually know off the top of my head, the trajectory of getting this added. And I've made a note of who asked that question. So we can definitely follow up with you um, afterwards. Uh, and somebody else just is uh, thanking you for being here and answering. Um, another person commented um, they had never seen the stats on the variants, and that was just really interesting um, as they're PEX-12 um, carriers. And uh, I just want to go back briefly to the person who had asked the question about their, uh, you know, 25-year-old adult um, mm -hmm. and not knowing their variants. And they did share, um, you know, they came back and were able to share that the person is still alive, mm -hmm. um, but testing would be logistically really difficult. Um, and they asked, is there a specific name of the test that they should ask for when trying to determine the variant that their adult child has? It would be a panel test. So what that means is you, uh, when it, when it's um, called a panel, that means that you're doing sequencing of all the genes listed on the panel. Um, so I can double check the exact name, but my assumption would be that it would be a PEX gene panel that would be need to be done. Um, but I, I can also get back on the exact name, but that that's what would need to be done. This type of sequencing panel. And I have that person's information as well. So we can make sure we connect with that person. Um, those are great questions. <laughs> great questions. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I know that with each question someone else is asking, usually someone else is also thinking it. So I know this is helpful for everyone. Um, we have someone who's really worried about their siblings or cousins being carried um, carriers. And I know that you shared that great graphic of how that works. So um, thank you for that, creating that graphic. Do you have any advice for how to share this risk with your extended family members? So in, in the genetics clinics that I've been in, um, it's not uncommon to help people and families make letters with this information to their extended family, um, outlining what was what was found, what type of genetic testing they can have. Um, it, it sounds more formal than it really is, um, but but that's one way that I've seen it work really well. And it's not actually super uncommon to talk about the condition and and talk about your experience um, to to your family. So that that would be a recommendation. Um, depending on, depending on how often you communicate with them and such. But 
in the letter, it helps you um, really specify the genetic variant, which will be the helpful information for them and any other details on the type of testing and information that um, you would have being, being a part of this community that they will have no idea about or just no experience with. Um, so it's just, it's just helpful to, to get down. Thank you so much. I know I love your, I love that advice actually that you just gave. I did the same thing. I can share that as a parent myself who was very concerned, I have a, a very large family. Um, and so for certain family members, I was able to, um, you know, even just follow up. It's one thing to even mention it, but I think that it's a really great option to write that letter and share the information with them, explain what the risks are and allows them to really, you know, have that information. They can go back and revisit it. Um, try to process what you're sharing with them. You're letting them know that, hey, you're at risk. And that's something that can be a little jarring maybe for some family members. So giving that letter allows them the time that they need to revisit it um, from time to time. But I also included in my letter, my genetic counselor's information, mm -hmm. my genetic mm -hmm. information. And that way they didn't need to come back to me if they didn't feel comfortable. They could go and schedule their own appointments with somebody um, that I was able to recommend and say, hey, they know our family and it will be private. For, so you can go talk to this genetic counselor. So I just wanted to add to that letter recommendation that maybe putting in your, your geneticist or genetic counselor's information could be really helpful. And good, uh, good that, point. That, I didn't even think of that. That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I did. I had a family member who took that information and went and saw our genetic counselor. So mm -hmm. I, I thought was. I'm really glad that I put that in there. And another piece that I just want to add for families listening is, um, and maybe you can add to this, is I know that for myself, it's it's very um, difficult to reach the point where, you know, you're sharing this information out of concern. You want your family members to know their risk and they may say, this can't happen to me. And they may choose to do nothing with that information. And that's where we just have to step back and be respectful and be respectful of their choices for their family and for themselves. That parent who has the adult, um, I'm so glad that you're here and we're able to answer all these questions for you. Um, they they said they have one more, which is once the PEX variant is identified, um, I can get my other child targeted testing for the variant and that this is the preferred method. Mm. Um, so yes. It sounds like there's so, a sibling that they're they're looking for you know, mm -hmm. to be able to test it. Yes. Um, usually this type of testing in the siblings um, of the individual is recommended just when they're an adult or closer to reproductive age. There's no, um, there's no rush uh, to test someone under 18 or not considering having a family at that time point. Um, so yes, if they're adult um, siblings, then, then that would absolutely um, be the genetic variants that you then uh, share with them so that they can get targeted testing. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, that's actually something that sometimes depending on the country and the testing, um, when you have prenatal testing, you will sometimes find out that the, um, that the fetus is not affected, but they may be a carrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so you may even find out in utero in some situations. Um, Absolutely. We also have the question, um, and I know it's, it's a little more related to the variant specifically and the clinical outcome, which I'm happy to share more information with again, um, with this family who's asking, um, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to share um, your knowledge. Do the PECS variants relate to the severity of the disease? This is such a good question. There are some variants that are associated with a more milder condition. And so um, there are others that are more, more related to a more severe condition. Um, those, there's a few that are known. Um, but as far as my knowledge goes, and Katie definitely chime in, um, there is um, in new variants that appear, it's not always easy to tell how severe the condition is going to be over time, what development and what progression is going to happen. Um, but there are some that are more common that have been studied more. And so it is um, easier to say or not. Yes. And I, I will absolutely chime in and share that mm -hmm. one of the examples I think was really helpful, especially to some of the newer families who asked this question. It's a great question. Um, it's asked a lot um, is when we have families who have several children who are affected, um, it really speaks volumes to that clinical um, course possibly being very different. Uh, so we have siblings that have the same variants that are affected um, and they're in the same home. So a lot of the factors are, are the same and they present very differently. 
Um, you can have a very mildly affected child and their brother or sister um, is very severely affected. And so um, that clinical course is just really unknown. It's, I know it's one of the more difficult, I, I would say one of the most difficult um, aspects yeah. of being a parent is just there's the unknowns of what's going to happen with your child with this disease makes it mm -hmm. very hard. And that's why our natural history studies are so important in the research. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's so many genetic factors outside of these 13 genes that we don't know, but they are having a more protective effect or not. Um, and, and we just don't know. So yes, uh, tracking and learning, um, and, and potentially more genetic testing over time might, might be something that happens. I do have um, one more question. It looks like, mm -hmm. why do uh, some places refuse to do carrier screening on healthy siblings that are still children, maybe minors mm -hmm. being tested? Yeah, it's, it's um, children being such a protected class, of course. Um, it comes into that realm of what is medically necessary for a child. And because the medical utility of them knowing that carrier status is not actually beneficial. So this isn't like a condition where being a carrier would result in, um, would result in medical features that that's why we're just, um, it's just protecting and making sure that the kids don't have any interventions or testing that isn't medically necessary. So definitely following up after they're able to consent at an older age or thinking of, about reproduction and planning their family themselves. But in, in general genetics for, for conditions that are not thought to um, manifest or occur in a carrier, it's usually not recommended to test the children. Thank you for answering that and sharing. I wanted to share one um, last thing, just while I give everyone an opportunity to ask any other questions they may have. Uh, you had mentioned about the testing timeframes, and I always uh, know that families are asking about the, when will I know the results when they do choose to have testing done on a pregnancy? And um, I think it's really important that you did share that it can take up to four weeks to receive those results. Um, and that, you know, knowing the variants um, sometimes can speed that process up. Um, however, there are so many different factors at play and that it can take up to four weeks. And I wanted to share my own personal experience. And I know that other families as well um, have had this where, you know, we do receive results as quickly as one week now. So um, that is something that, you know, as time goes by and technology advances, sometimes you're able to get it quickly. But I really think it's important that you share that it, it can take up to four weeks. And sometimes what's happening in that lab, you just can't speed that process up. Some, some of this is so dependent on the local resources of your, of your medical clinic and your lab, which is um, can, yeah, challenging to understand. Thank you again uh, for being with us and just taking the time. Uh, many may not know that you're all the way from Switzerland joining us today. So I appreciate you um, collaborating with us. I'm so grateful that we were able to have this opportunity um, to come together and just really help our families navigate family planning after a rare diagnosis. To our audience, uh, thank you uh, for participating, for asking such great questions today. We will be uh, sending out a survey. Um, actually, at the very end of this, it should pop up. If not, you will get an email follow-up and your feedback is truly appreciated. Um, it helps us plan and know how we can uh, better help you navigate all the different challenges that come with this rare disease. So thank you again for being thank with you. us.